Joe Kinzer is our next guest on the program from the Berkeley County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, and he himself a candidate for the position of prosecuting attorney. Good morning, Joe. Great to have you, buddy. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Good to see y'all. You guys were very busy recently, and uh, several indictments were handed out, and many of these drug-related, Joe. Yes. we. Um, it, this past term of the grand jury, the February term, we had 99 indictments returned, um, and I believe of those 99, 42 of them were drug-related. Um, and 15 specifically were... Uh, done by the uh, Berkeley County Drug and Violent Crime, or the Eastern Panhandle Drug and Violent Crime Task Force. Um, and the common denominator on many of these is fentanyl. Yes, that's the one that uh, seems to be giving us the, the biggest concern right now, mainly just because of its lethality. We had um, multiple cases this term of delivery of a controlled substance resulting in death um, that we indicted, and those were fentanyl cases for sure how's that fentanyl get here any idea um you know it, it it comes in 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 various ways i know um once you know when we're dealing with it at the prosecutor's office it's obviously made its way to west virginia that's when it comes into our jurisdiction and into our wheelhouse um, but i know the folks especially over at the eastern panhandle drug and violent crimes task force they they don't just stop with what happens here they they follow it and they work with uh, oftentimes the United States Attorney's Office to track back where it comes from. But, um, you know, due to our locality, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of it makes its way here by way of Baltimore and Philadelphia, is my understanding. You were mentioning, Joe, that fentanyl is in just about everything when you do lab tests now. You know, it's it, I hate to say it this way, but like it, it's it's come a long way from when we first started seeing fentanyl in this area. And now all kinds of mixtures of drugs when they're taken, you know, seized roadside or, or by a search warrant by law enforcement and we send it down to our lab, um, so much so much of the material we send down is now coming down with, with at least percentages of fentanyl mixed in with it. Give me an example of some drugs that you wouldn't think fentanyl would be in that they're now in. I mean, we see it in these they're called synthetic cathinones, um, and there's all these wonderful names for them that scientists have given them that we have to put in the indictment and we have to say if it, if it goes to trial that none of us can pronounce for anything. Um, but they are these uh, designer drugs. They're, they're manufactured by someone who uh, has a good understanding of chemistry, and they tweak a little here, tweak a little there, and now... Um, and, and we've seen Eutalone was the most popular one, which I can say uh, was the most popular one for a long time. Uh, but it's constantly changing, and the variants that we're seeing are uh, oftentimes now having fentanyl in them. How deadly is fentanyl? It, incredibly so. Uh, you know, I, I hate to give like those, oh, it's 100 times more powerful than this or 100 times more powerful than this kind of heroin or, or this or that, but it is the type of situation where whether it's a first-time user or like a, a seasoned um, addict of some kind, it's it's killing people. It's it's killing a lot of people. And uh, thankfully, you know, our community and our county specifically has done so much because it can't a one-sided approach to fentanyl or, or drugs in general. The opioid epidemic uh, was was never going to work. Just arresting people and you know locking people up that was never going to be a successful strategy. So um, I'm personally so proud of our county and what we've done with adult drug court, juvenile drug court, the Day Report Center, Mountaineer Recovery Center, the Catalyst Program for, for juveniles. Um, all of those efforts have done so much to assist folks suffering from addiction. And it ultimately, you need that one-two punch. You, you need to aggressively go against the dealers. I think that that's still important and get the stuff off the streets, but you also got to treat the demand side. And we do that. I mean, other counties in the state are really looking to Berkeley County. We, we've set the standard for treatment-based initiatives through the court system. Is this grand jury now discharged? Um, well, they're, they're done for now. They'll be back in May, and then they'll be back again in October. So this was their first grand jury as a group and um, they did a great job Billy yeah good morning Joe good morning. Uh, in the last couple so years we've had at least two maybe three or more 
uh, highly publicized drug bust and been a, a, consequ- a been result of several different agencies working together. Uh, and you just mentioned the litany of activities that Berkeley County is doing for both the, uh, the treatment and also the prevention. What is a trend? Are we seeing more? Are we seeing less? And if we're seeing more, what, what in addition can we do to reverse the trend? Well, I'll tell you, I also um, participate in um, the, the Bridges meeting. It's once a month um, where a lot of us in the county get together and talk about the, you know, from, and, and we're getting a lot of information from the hospitals, um, from the emergency rooms, from treatment folks of what they're seeing and what is constantly changing and that's really like the long-term big picture it's hard to tell because it's constantly changing so much and we're having to stay on top of it all the time from both a treatment perspective and a and a prosecution perspective you know one of the things that we found out from the folks at uh, wvu uh, through the hospital was you know a while back whatever the main source of fentanyl in the area it it had changed and and the composition of the fentanyl had changed to where it stayed in someone's system for a whole lot longer than fentanyl ever previously did we had folks who were were you know clean if you will for 30 days and they were still testing positive for this stuff and that was you know new information that's then passed out at this meeting that goes to law enforcement and the courts and everything else and and it's great information to have, but you know, big picture, it's it's hard to tell when you're in the day to day of it, just constantly trying to manage the changes as they're happening. It's a, it's a constant battle. How frustrating is it to you and your colleagues if it's constantly changing and you do not see a significant reduction in the availability? You know, it it can be frustrating, but that's public service. You know, I mean that that's what we all signed up for. We all signed up to, to fight these problems and to try to help our community. And, you know, it is balanced by the successes that we see. You know, the Day Report Center is incredibly successful. Uh, their recidivism rate at Day Report is incredibly low. I want to say it's around like 18% compared to um, astronomically high numbers when you're talking about recidivists of of, uh, drug relapse and things like that without that treatment. Um, And those are people who are not getting arrested again, which means they are not in our jail, which means they are, you know, hopefully gainfully employed and out in our community being productive members of our community. So, you know, it's hard to quantify that, but those successes do make it worth it for us. Maria? So full disclosure, um, my husband oversees um, adult drug court, and I always know what kind of day it is on Thursday, because he does that on Thursday afternoons, and I sort of tiptoe in early Thursday evenings and say, so, how was it? And um, I'm always um, sort of amazed by the, the stories and like you said, the success. And I think, again, I think some people believe that, um, you know, or don't understand the differentiation between a drug crime and and a, a criminal, a, a, another crime. And, you know, just throw them, throw them in the hooskow and let them, <laughs> you know, do whatever. But, you know, when someone has a drug issue that may not be the solution to that not to mention the jail bills as you alluded to and everything so um, you know so I would like you to talk a little bit about some of those successes that you've seen through the day report center through drug court um, and why you think it's working yes well um, and you know I think uh, the judge would probably be the first one to tell you that in, when you're talking about addiction and you're talking about recovery, uh, a lot of times you celebrate little victories, right? Little victories are huge for these folks. Um, and to be able to see, I've had to, uh, not had to, I've had the opportunity to cover uh, occasionally as the representative from our office for both adult and juvenile drug court. Um, and that's that's really like on a micro level, It's it's praise for success 
consequence for for a failure of some kind and giving those folks that and, and being upfront with them and uh, Judge Lawrenson does a phenomenal job with it. I, his patience is um, is wonderful. But the successes that you see, uh, those little victories along the way, along the road for these people, which become huge in their recovery, um, even though they might seem small. And, but then you have, you know, you do have the graduations, the folks that, that make it through and graduate. And the great part is not having to see them again professionally. You know, that's the real benefit. I actually spoke to the, a, a family member of a young woman who I prosecuted years ago. And um, this woman, when I dealt with her, was a, a train wreck. She was in the middle of just heavy addiction. Um, her, her children were, uh, I, at that time, I was doing the abuse and neglect docket, but I was also doing some criminal cases. And, you know, her addiction had gotten to a point where she couldn't care for her children. Um, and and it, was, it was a mess. And it's one of those things where during the case, you know, you look and you go, gosh, I wonder how much time she has left. Like that, that's how bad it seemed she was in addiction. And, um, and through the case I had, she ended up going to prison. Um, and then she came out and uh, I ended up talking with her family member recently. And she's clean. She um, has a, another child that she has lawful custody of, that she's living with a family member. She's doing well. She's employed. She's doing all of these things. Uh, and those kind of stories and hearing that, it, it makes the tough times better sometimes to hear those successes. Yeah, you're uh, uh, getting fairly close to the primary. Yes. Uh, how, what are you doing to let the world know, or the county know, that you're, you're running for prosecuting attorney? Sure. Well, you know, I'm staying busy. I'm, I'm trying to get out to all these events. It's been wonderful to meet so many folks in the, uh, in the community. I've, I've loved it. I've loved the person-to-person -person interaction that I'm able to have. Uh, we recently got our first load of signs in, so we've been deploying them um, throughout the county and had a lot of folks reaching out asking for signs. So I spend my evenings driving around, dropping them off to people who have uh, requested them. And uh, it's it's kind of fun to drive around and see those pop up. And excuse me a second. I think I'm correct in saying that the <laughs> primary race is the race. You yes. do, uh, There is not a... Comp compo race on in the journal it's, it's going to be determined in may that's correct yep i've got uh, uh the primary and then that uh, that will decide everything and uh who do you have an opponent i do okay. i do uh local defense attorney okay joe give us the specs man why should people vote for you um you know my slogan for the campaign has been tough fair and experienced but and, and I think it really all comes down to that last word, experience. Uh, I've been prosecuting crime here in Berkeley County as an assistant prosecutor for nine years. And I have uh, done it all through the office. E even uh, in most recent years, a lot of the administrative tasks, Katie has uh, trusted me enough to delegate those to me with, with hiring and personnel issues and this whole other world that doesn't actually involve being in a courtroom trying cases uh, that is a, a prerequisite for uh, having this job. So, you know, I've earned the respect and trust of the other prosecutors in the office. I have their support uh, in law enforcement and, uh, as well. Um, and the victim advocates and child advocates that we work with hand in hand every day, you know, their support has really been the most uh, uplifting thing for me. Um, and I'm so proud. I was, uh, I've been endorsed by the West Virginia Troopers Association. I'm very proud of that endorsement, um, you know, because I've established relationships based upon trust with, with these folks and they know I'm the right man for the job. Joe, would you be more of an office manager, prosecuting attorney, or in the courtroom style prosecuting attorney? I think both are very important, but I'm a, I'm a courtroom guy till I die. That's, that's what I've done forever. I am a trial lawyer. I'm a trial prosecutor. And, and I've tried cases, you know, back before I was a prosecutor, I was a defense attorney. I was a public defender, uh, always been a public servant in one manner, but um, it, it's very different. It's very different to try a case as a prosecutor. It, you carry the burden. So you have to be organized. You have to be prepared and ready to go. And you walk in and you present your case. And there's there's so much to it, whereas uh, on a defense side, most of it is, you know, kind of sitting back and trying to poke holes and find problems in the evidence. 
um, I've I've established myself as a, a very successful prosecutor, and I intend to continue to prosecute, just as Katie has. I mean, I've prosecuted more cases to trial than any other assistant in the office, you know, during the last 10 years. Um, but Katie's prosecuted, Katie's tried more cases than me. Uh, you know, she sets the, the tone with that, and I would follow in that in her footsteps, I believe. Talk a little bit about the whole issue of plea bargaining. Sure. I think another piece people don't always understand is that why would you allow, you know, this person to get away with or make a make a bargain um, to um, to do that? Do you feel confident in your ability to try those cases? What what constitutes that whole piece? That is such an excellent question. Um, Statistically, across the country, I think it's over 90, maybe even over 95 percent of criminal cases don't go to trial. They, they, they plead out. And there are several reasons for that. Um, most notably, there's, there's too many cases to, to prosecute. Uh, we, we would never have enough time to try all these cases. But what, when you're electing a prosecutor, you are electing them for their judgment. I, that is a huge part of what you're of what you're doing. You're, you're kind of hiring uh, someone for their judgment in what is fair, what is the just outcome of a case, what is appropriate. And to make those kind of decisions as to how to plea negotiate a case, we look at the strength of the case. You know, there might be probable cause to arrest somebody for something, but looking at the evidence, I mean, our job as a prosecutor is to evaluate the case and see how strong it is. And maybe there's big holes in the case. You know, maybe there's enough to enough to arrest somebody. But you look at it and you go, if I present that to a jury, I'm not going to win. I think they I think they did it. There's probable cause to believe that they did it. But thinking someone did something, even knowing someone did something isn't enough as a prosecutor. I've got to be able to prove it. And if I can't prove it, then we need to talk about some kind of plea. Um, there's also other considerations. Your victim. If, you, if this is a crime that involves a victim, um, we are absolutely re-traumatizing a victim when they testify. That's something that we know. And we, we, if we have to, you know, we will, we will do it. We do it often um, in important cases. And sometimes those victims are children, which makes it exponentially more difficult um, because it just hurts. I'll be honest. You know, it, it, it hurts to, to do that. Um, but those are often considerations that we, we take into account when we're considering a plea deal. Um, one of the things I look to as a prosecutor uh, when I'm thinking about a plea offer is I look at their criminal history. You know, is this a person who messed up? You know, I, I firmly believe in second chances, firmly believe. But I also believe in three strikes and you're out. I think you can have those joint uh, beliefs that, that people deserve a second chance, but they don't deserve a 12th chance all the time. Joe, who makes the determination whether something is a felony or misdemeanor? Um, well, you know, when it comes to charging decisions, it's just what do the facts support? You know, felonies are any crime in West Virginia that's punishable by uh, a year or more, and, and those are punishable in a prison uh, setting, whereas misdemeanors are under a year or a year and under, and they are uh, done in, in jail. That's the, the maximum penalty is from a jail cell. But does your does the prosecuting attorney's office make that decision, or is it done by the arresting officer or, or who? Well, a little column A, a little column B. So on the front end, the officers normally make those decisions. But then if there's a, uh, you know, there have been plenty of times where we've reviewed a criminal complaint that comes in in magistrate court that's charged as a misdemeanor and looked at it and went, I think this is a felony and we can recharge that. Sure. And then certainly our way of uh, prosecuting felonies is through the grand jury system. And so, you know, there might be an instance where the officer charges one felony and we look at it and we say, OK, or there's continued investigation after arrest and we get more evidence and things. And we go, you know, this is this is seven felonies. We're going to indict seven. You know, we we make that charging decision on felonies when it gets to the grand jury. Joe, I want to ask you about some recent locally elected officials in Berkeley and in Jefferson County uh, that have uh, lost their positions or uh, even, as we saw yesterday, actually had arrest warrants uh, in, in Jefferson County put out. Uh, one of the things that typically happens when local officials have potential legal issues is we get a special prosecutor. Yes. Why can't those cases be prosecuted by the prosecutor of that county routinely? Sure. Uh, you know, Routinely, the reason why, and, and obviously, you know, 
there was the situation in, in Berkeley County where we had a special prosecutor for an elected official, um, and that's because we want to have we, we don't want to have the appearance of any kind of impropriety. We want the public. You know, there's there's often, especially in West Virginia, there's a healthy distrust of government. And I appreciate it. I'm a West Virginian for life. I, I, I like a good, healthy distrust of government. But, you know, you don't want people that have these friendly, personal and professional relationships being the ones investigating each other. It's not it's not a good look. Even if I truly believed, hey, I could could follow my oath and investigate um, a an elected official in the county who I have personal and professional relationships with, yes, I could trust myself to do that investigation and do what's right. Um, it's about giving the public the ability to have more faith in in the investigation and, and what happens by being able to just step outside of the box a little bit, give a little bit of room, and have a neutral third party come in and do those kind of prosecutions. Is it an additional cost when a, pro a special prosecutor gets involved? Um, not really. There, there's the um, Prosecutors Institute uh, is what handles all that for the state. That's prostitute for short, I guess. Right? Uh, yeah. Yep, yep. Prostitute for short. You could call it that. Now, the Prosecutors Institute, uh, they, they do our, um, they do like our summer conferences and everything like that for prosecutors. And they also handle when we have a request for uh, a special prosecutor. And the originating county you know, we're responsible for like their, their per diem, like travel, you know, mm -hmm. like the mileage. It's, it's really nominal. Uh, we don't have to pay uh, too much more. I, I understand not wanting the appearance of impropriety mm -hmm. or favoritism or such, but when you're elected, you take an oath to uphold your office. It doesn't say you're elected to uphold your office unless you know somebody that's run afoul of the law in that case you mm -hmm. get to re, you know you get to step out of the room for that yeah. it, it seems that that oath would be all inclusive well and and it is and again i i, I have all the faith in the world and my ability and, and katie's ability to you know it well especially that particular situation in berkeley county i mean at that time you're talking about the elected sheriff of the county the mm -hmm. the, the two chief law enforcement officers of the county are the the sheriff and the elected prosecutor, and they have to have a positive working relationship or, or it's gonna be very difficult. And they did at the time, they had a positive working relationship and that's hard to do when you know I'm investigating you for possible crimes. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's just several reasons like that, that, that when it's that close to home, there's a, uh, it creates what we call a conflict in the law, and it's best to step out. Let's take these relationships in a different uh, angle altogether. Uh, the prosecuting attorney must, by definition, needs to work with other elected officials. Yes. How well do you work with, how well do you know the county commission, for example, or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, circuit court? Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the circuit... Uh, Circuit courts, I mean, I... And circuit clerk as well. Sure. Um, I, I certainly have great relationships established with the uh, the judges and the circuit courts. The county commission, I, I get along with them incredibly well. Um, I'm often, uh, if Katie is unavailable for particular meetings and such, uh, she sends me in her stead. So, you know, right now the big talk in the county is the uh, the proposed changed which was approved uh, regarding sick leave uh, for Berkeley County employees and you know I've sat in on those meetings and and asked questions and worked with those folks on the commission and we just have a wonderful working relationship together um, and uh, and and the county clerk as well I've, I've had had very decent uh, runnings with those and the uh, and Shelley Shoppard of course yeah. uh, who is just one of the most fantastic human beings I've ever met. Um, we have a great relationship as well. Joe, where can uh, our good uh, folks in the audience find out more about your campaign for prosecuting attorney? Sure. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Joe Kinzer for Prosecutor, or I uh, have a website, joekinzerforprosecutor.com. I'd love to hear from you. Good to see you again, Joe. Always a pleasure.